Hey, hey. Hi. I um have you, how have you found like um uh using Zoom and all these other mediums and, um. and kind of <laughs> straddling Zoom and Insta Live and this and that? Um, yeah, it's been okay. It's, you know, okay. I, I've, I've had to recalibrate my whole, like, thing in terms of social media. Um, it's been, like, a recalibration, <laughs> you know, in, mm -hmm. in terms of, like, I think now I'm, I've become really kind of obsessed with frame, framing. Okay. With, like, the frame that you present yourself in. Um, yeah. So, like, I have, like, three spots in, in, in the place <laughs> that I live that I like to kind of use as a frame. And, yeah, you know, and it means like trying to find more and more creative ways of oh, sorry, more and more creative ways of framing myself. Um, yeah, yeah. So even like now, it's like white background and this whatever it is behind me. Um, and I'm yeah. like, that's great. I, I like it. <laughs> As now, you, to, do you wear a different color shirt depending on the color of the background? Like, do you, are you doing? Are you? Are you doing a fashion thing as well? No, no. But what I do is I wear all my clothes at home, like to breakfast. You know, I, I don't have any differentiation between going out and just being in the house. So, so I, you don't I dress have road up. clothes and you don't have road clothes and home clothes and church clothes and No, no. I wear all my clothes. Like literally, like it is hilarious. I get up and I put all my best clothes. Like you no one even sees my best clothes actually. Because for me, like, and, and clothes is actually how it feels on me. So, mm. like, I am, I, you know, people think, oh, you're wearing it because they see it. For me, I'm wearing it because I feel so good, <laughs> you know. You're wearing <laughs> well, it because I, I'm wearing it because I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see myself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, looking in the mirror and I go, sometimes I wear stuff and I just laugh at it. <laughs> it's got so funny. And that's been something to get, you know, that's been... I mean, a good thing to get me through the whole, you know, lockdown um, mentality uh, of yes. mentalness is just trying to uh, entertain myself um, by giving myself jokes, wearing like fun yeah. hats or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's true. that's actually so funny. I'm just thinking about it again. Just getting dressed up in the morning, just in preparation for for just for porridge for yeah. oatmeal. Try it out. It's, I really, I highly recommend it. Just put on your best clothes and then go and make yourself your outfit or whatever and start working and tuck your shirt into your trousers as well. I feel you finding that, that helps. <laughs> That's you know? um, I have a few questions about um, kind of looking back at history. Um, and I want to talk just specifically about the We Are Set by History uh, project because it would be the most recent one. Um, but the kind of Afro-Caribbean as well as the um, African and South African influences in the music. Um, and just some questions about where you pulled from and what your reference points were. Just before we go on, because I think that's the yeah. important thing. Who are you? Oh, Someone me. Someone down there. Oh, um... Yeah, well, I'm a part of Eternal Remedy, so that's cool as well. Um, Eternal Remedy is an art collective, um, and so I work with Eternal Remedy. Um, but I'm also a writer and a chef, and I own a art collective, or I started an art collective called Station um, about a year ago-ish. Um, but also worked on a few creative projects in the interim, so a lot of my creative work is, um, is mostly writing um, and thinking about um, the politics of urban life and how Black life is often affected by those strains, um, particularly within the ways... My name's Kat. <laughs> what is not doing my name? It's like, I'm this person. This I am, I'm just an incognito individual. But, um, yeah, so working out of Southeast London um, and did a few pop-up restaurants over the past couple of years within South London. And that was mainly my practical work over the past couple of years, but that's necessarily changed with the with everything that's gone on, right? So the the whole restaurant, the framework of the restaurant, again, on the idea of literal and kind of metaphorical burning, that yeah. that might might necessarily be the case in, in the upcoming future. So working on a, a few projects within just a way to kind of circulate, um, circulate energy and frequency between our community globally and locally 
um, is a is a part of kind of what I'm looking forward to doing in the, in the near future. Um, ways that we can actually materialize and optimize our work. And that's the hardest you are. part, really. Yeah, who, who am I? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an artist and I'm just living. But yeah, so kind of just going back to what the reference point of maybe your music and where you pulled from. Say the question again. <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying like your reference point within um, We Are Sent by History and where you pulled from like where some of those references were and maybe where you started, where you started to look to see mm. kind of what that, the idea of history, because it's been so fragmented historically. So where mm. for, for, cause if we're thinking about people who are starting to consider what history means to them and their own creative purpose and want to find a place to look and to pull from for a lot of people yeah. that can feel quite challenging, can't it? Yeah. Uh, and actually, you know, I, the, even the term history, um is it's not contested i guess because um it's contested by me um yeah. but i think it's it's it's, it's not helpful in, in considering yeah. it in a holistic way you know like yeah. history is is how situations unfolded in the past you know yeah if we're having this conversation between us there are two sides to it there's yeah. me talking or you talking and you interpreting what I'm saying, considering yeah. everything that you've gone through, and you've gone through a, mm. maybe a very different life to me. Um, yeah. There might be similarities, there might be points of intersection, but I have no way of knowing how my words affect you. Only you know that. History, mm. for me, is figuring out all the sides of the interaction. Mm. You know? History isn't, you know, I could say, I had this conversation with Kat, and mm. it was great. And I said all of these things and she said all of these things. That, for me, that's not history. That's, yeah. you, know, you know, propaganda. That's me saying, you know, I did this at this, no, not propaganda to the extreme, but that's just yeah. me recounting a story. Whereas history is actually the balancing of, um, of perspectives, mm. you know? So if you're looking, if you're trying to fig figure, you know, like what, what history means to any specific um, particular individual is first yeah. figuring out what you're trying to look into really and mm. actually what are all the sides, what are the sides and how do you figure, you know, figure out the sides. All history isn't written, you know. You yeah. have oral history, you know. You can have history by talking to your grandparents, you know. Yes. You know, history can be there by, talk, you know, by, by reading. History can be there by, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a process I've, I've found, you know. For instance, in, if you're looking at the album, it's sent here by history. Uh, one of the big conversations, as I said before, was that we were talking about masculinity and vulnerability. Yeah. Um, and looking at the, you know, the, the kind of patriarchal tendencies that they are in, you know, in, in South African society. Um, and they're saying, you know, it, you can't look at it divorced from the, the, the social and political history of the nation. You yeah. can't look at, you know, it's, it's not possible. You have to look at everything in terms of, the, the tensions and the pressures that have been placed on black life in terms of seeing yes. the manifestations of those in negative, you know, spheres, you know, and yes. the only way we're going to get, um, you know, kind of solutions to, 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 to certain problems is by seeing how causality is created through the, you know, mm. through situations that happened in the past. You know? Yeah. I think that kind of is, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that kind of draws home the point that we need to be the ones that are the carriers of the history, whatever it may be. Because that kind of nuanced perspective and that difference in opinions that are still our own are important. And that's kind of how the issue that we've seen, particularly in things like journalism or the writing or the narration of Black music or the narration of, of uh, the culinary world in particular. Yeah. When you have, um, and and recently just i was just writing a piece about um the black black women in london and the kind of emergence of black chefs in london and how the the words that have been used to describe food that has come out of the african diaspora is often referenced as antiquated or lagging or home style cooking or all of these words that don't really highlight the technical complexity of these cuisines that come out there's a time and there's a process and there's 
a certain waiting period that needs to to happen in order to kind of um, expose and allow the flavors within a lot of these cuisines to to show themselves and without knowing these histories and these philosophies and these pro and these processes within the culinary world within the music world um, within the art world as kind of an umbrella term um, these stories are necessarily going to be lost there's yeah. no way to, to use the language that is appropriate that would accurately con contextualize how important these processes and these histories are and so yeah. when you have people that aren't from our kind of um our communities writing about these histories they're di they're necessarily disrupted and our stories are lost within that within that interruption yeah exactly um i think you know that that kind of hit on the crucial point which is that there needs to be an acknowledgement of of not knowing and mm. you know it, especially in the british context the one thing yeah. that i've found that british people are i say british people um you know, your stereotypical idea of a white British person. The one thing mm -hmm. that I, I would say, and this is a very subjective thing, um, but maybe it's not subjective, um, but it's just that I've seen across a lot of different areas is that there's yeah. a reluctance to admit not knowing. Of um, course. You know, and that, you know, if you're looking at history, you know, this, and you see it today, just in terms of like how articles are written, how history, the idea of history is presented there's a reluctance to, under, to kind of realize that what British people have been given as history in schools in terms of the curriculum hasn't been yeah. history. It has literally yeah. been propaganda in yeah. terms of presenting an incomplete version of um, sequence of events. So, yeah. you know, and unless that like fundamental truth that, you know, the population of a country has been told, has been, has been, manipulated into believing that it knows you know when it doesn't mm -hmm. you know unless that truth is, is kind of gotten to there's going to be no you know there's going to be no real going forward because like you know all the whole thing yeah. about you know um Ch church hill what how his legacy should be respected or not um who certain slave owners were for me the problem is just people just don't understand what these people have done you know? yeah you know, it's they, 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 it's like as a black person, I, I, who is interested in going back and understanding how the sequence of events in the world relates to my specific culture. You know, I'll yeah. read the books, do the work um, of thinking about how the how the past could have been. You know, outside of what I've been told, the past is. Um, mm. And what the future, I think, should be, you know, and how that relates to the present. If you've not mm. done that that work, that that foundational work of trying to uncover what has been obstructed from us, then yeah. you won't know. But then, if there is then a kind of post-colonial arrogance in assuming that you do know, you know, as and mm. I and I would say if, if you're looking at Britain as not the society that we see today, but a product of a longer trajectory of of history you know so yeah. if you're looking at what what it means to, you know to be british in in relation to empire in relation to post empire and in relation to what that means in terms of the mentality of of its citizens and how yeah. that mentality relates to what the british empire considers to be the other considers to be you know the the natives even if those natives are now the natives actually of, of everywhere else in the world even if those natives are now living within the so-called mother country you know there there is an arrogance there that is ingrained yeah. that's embedded you know so that's you know when you go back to the whole um kind of black lives matter as a slogan phenomenon as said by white people you know for mm -hmm. me that's one of the most important things that could come out of it you know the idea that people are realizing that there is more to the history of the nation than they are aware of you know and you know potentially they'll try to find out more about you know what it means to be british yeah and i mean that what it means to be british is so subjective for so many people and when we even think about the difference between referencing being english and being british just assumes two different experiences in and of themselves yeah. was there a point where you like decided that you would refer to yourself as british because that has a little bit of a subcultural context 
Um, the difference between British and English, I, I never really understood it. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, 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 for me, it's just labels, are, uh, you know, it, are, are labels. It's like, you know, sometimes if I'm talking to certain people, if, I'll say I'm Barbadian. If, some, if, mm. a, if a black Caribbean person says, where are you from? I'll go, I'm from Barbados, because obviously I'm from Barbados, yeah. you know. Yeah. Whereas if some, I'm talking to, I don't know, some European on tour, and they go, where are you from? I'm not going to say I'm Barbadian, I'm going to say I'm British. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, for their purposes, yeah. for the purpose of that interaction I am, um, mm -hmm. and for the purposes of actually an ongoing fight for to be seen as an eco-citizen, within the country that we are living in, you know, we are yeah. British, you know, because if we're not, then actually what is the struggle for? The struggle is to be recognised for what we are, which is citizens. Yeah. You know? And actually, even within the Rinrush generation, it's like, you know, the Commonwealth citizens were British, you know, if you're mm -hmm. just looking at it on a legal, on a legal basis, they, you know, they were British citizens, um, yeah. out, you know, outside of Britain. Um, but, you know, that existed on, on a legal framework and on a framework that which, which um, benefited them in terms of being able to travel back, you know, from, from the Caribbean to, to Britain um, to work. But it doesn't mean that that's all they are. It doesn't mean that that yeah. definition defines them. You know, everything, I mm -hmm. that's one of the things that it's like they try to program into us because we call you a thing or because we made you call yourself a thing. That means that's mm -hmm. what you are. And I'm like, I can call myself whatever I want. I might call myself British today, I might call myself African tomorrow, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. I've right. definitely experienced that same thing within the culinary world, that there's, there's, because there's boxes between your, your, your dietary preferences in the, in the culinary world, you know? I am a, a, a vegan chef. I'm not a vegan chef, but within the constructs and within the structures of the, the market, it's, 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 there's this necessary kind of pressure to to be within these boxes in order to make yourself palatable to the marketable public and so I find within the culinary world that a lot of people predominantly black chefs have found that quite challenging to be able to carve out your own space particularly because the cost of the restaurant space is so expensive and it's really difficult to penetrate um, and then a lot of people haven't it's been difficult to find the freedom to be able to create the food that is true to your own thought and your own thinking process. And that just because you're a chef that is of Jamaican descent, that cooks Jamaican food, that the food doesn't need to be presented in a way that is kind of what people would consider stereotypical or conventional Jamaican food. That you're allowed to be an artist even within that space and create the food that you feel is true to your own ideas and your own experiences. Um, and so when we think about like, this gradual syn synthesis, sorry, of experiences and thoughts and ideas and observations. I'm thinking about maybe how you managed to pivot um, and, and, and if there was a switch in your kind of creative methodology um, in, in, any, in any way. In between when? Between what? Um, kind of the shift into lockdown and how, how everything has, because I would say for me particularly within the, the culinary world, um, it was challenging to kind of think about what life would look like outside of the restaurant space and how I would still be able to create um, something that was true to me and not just put it up online on Instagram. Like that yeah. medium is still a space that may not live beyond this disaster in 20 to 30 years. And so yeah. much of what we do is about experience, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think I approach it from a different perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. in that for me it became the, the creative industry the live music industry has has come to a standstill so the okay. only way people are going to ingest live music is through these mediums like instagram yeah. and, and facebook and blah 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 um yeah. so for me it was about how do i then adjust to be able to present um present myself in the way that i i would like over you know over these mediums and so then yeah. it's just about researching technology you know okay. before before the lockdown if i needed to record myself playing i'd put my phone recorder on and i'd play into it um mm -hmm. as soon as the lockdown happened and i'm i started to really think about actually what is happening you know people are the only live music that people are hearing is yeah you playing on the other side of your phone um yeah. i'm not happy with the sound that i'm making you know yeah. I'm not happy with, you know, for me, the sound is, sound is important, you know, the sound that yeah. comes out of my saxophone, the sound that, of the, the kind of PA system, 
um, sound on my speakers. So I'm like, I need to get my sound better. So that was a big yeah. chunk of my lockdown, trying to figure out how do I make the sound that people hear of me, you know? And you can probably hear if you go through my Instagram videos, there's a point where the sound just gets a lot better, you know? I say better, yeah. but the sound becomes a lot more detailed. Um, mm. And it's constantly being updated. I'm probably trying to work on it. Um, yeah. That's funny that you say that because that made me think about um, that. That made me think about Arthur Jaffa, and Arthur Jaffa made a reference to um, James Brown and his kind of initial um, idea of the play on the word bad, and how yeah. he would reference bad, and then bad was like super bad, and kind of people's first initial experience of the word bad means exactly what it is in his nature. But kind of James Brown did a did a double down on the word and made bad cool. You know, yeah. and so when Arthur Jaffa started to to make films along with John O'Comfort and a few other um, directors, he the distortion of the visuals within his um, within his work was was important. Like mm -hmm. the quality didn't need to be good, and that was that was a part of the of the work. Yeah. So I wonder if there is a little bit of a thing here where like the the bad quality of the visuals of playing the clarinet or the sax is is maybe a new kind of take shape to a new thing that the high quality sound and high quality images. I, I'm interested in maybe if that kind of creative process can still exist across multiple mediums. Because we have HD on one end and then we have Arthur Jaffa that's making like this <laughs> idea of bad film, right? Yeah, so but it's all the same thing, you know? Yeah. And it's all the same thing in that it's artists presenting an, an idea or a, a vision of what they want their, you know, a, a, taking agency in how they present themselves yeah. to the audience. So for me, the, the, the bad quality in Arthur Jaffa's uh, work isn't, isn't bad. It's just that he's saying i want to present my work in this way you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's the sure. same as me saying i want to present my work in this way but it might be that mm -hmm. mine is in more high fidelity than his um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the idea of the abstract idea of it is the same which is we are going to take agency in how we present ourselves to our audience mm -hmm. over the yeah. internet yeah um, but going back to another aspect of how i've had to adjust myself during lockdown in terms of my practice um i'm in a in a flat which has people on top of me and people below me um, mm. which hasn't been a problem at all because you know i'm near to a park and like that's that's my my big thing i like the park um yeah. but it means that i can't play the sax loudly um, um and i've never needed to because i'm always on the road if i want to practice i can practice in the dressing room you know yeah. so what happens is that all of a sudden i'm in a place uh, i'm in this kind of confine um, and what it made me do is have to deal with uh, an area of playing that I've needed to deal with for such a long time, which mm. is the ability to play quietly. And this yeah. has been something that a lot of older musicians, like I've been getting the kind of hints of it throughout the years of this is a thing that you need to do, uh, or yeah. that one needs to do as a musician to go to the next level, um, be able to basically make a fun, like make a sound that's so quiet that is yeah. you're know, trying to find a point where the kind of breathing of breath creates the first initial sound on your instrument. Mm -hmm. So at that point where you're just, you can hear air going through the instrument and the, fir mm -hmm. the very first air becoming, you know, the re-vibrating enough that it becomes a sound, your technique needs to be good enough in terms of your kind of muscular strength that you hold on to that and you keep it straight like a sine wave. Mm. and that just requires real kind of breath support muscular support um kind of real focus on the kind of diaphragm um yeah. and it means that you can play really quietly and no one's going to hear you uh so throughout lockdown that's what i've been doing play really quietly and i can happily say now i can play so quietly that someone can be sleeping right next to me and, i mean yeah. playing everything from the top to the bottom of the instrument um yeah. and that's been a really great thing you know to have to to work on that, but with the practical aspect of not pissing off neighbours. And it's not that I've got bad neighbours. They've probably, you know, they've said to me they don't mind me playing. But I, I am very conscious of myself when I'm playing. I don't, I don't like people to hear me, you know, yeah. practicing. I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not that guy that's practicing really loud saxophone. I, I, I practice really quietly. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
that's that and that disruption has necessarily caused you to just completely shift the way you engage with the instrument i think it's joe mcphee that does that does that i don't yeah. i don't remember who he does but he does something quite similar to that where i'm like is that a note that he's playing because i can't yeah. really hear it because it's so quiet but so many people have like made mention of, of um circular breathing and that it's a quite a difficult thing to to uh, to accomplish and a quite difficult thing to do is that is that correct um no it's not that difficult if you've been playing it your whole musical life <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and for me it's like it's something i remember working on it really when i started playing the clarinet like you know it's it, i think one of my friends at school were all trying to do it in barbados yeah. when i was maybe like yeah. 10 um yeah. And, you know, we just try to do it and, you know, like experiment with things. And it's just something that I've been literally experimenting with. So I've been playing the saxophone, well, I've been playing the clarinet for about, let's see, for 27 years. Wow. You know? And I've wow. been trying a circular breathe for most of that time, you know. Yeah. So after a certain amount of time, it's just about, you, you get, if once you know how to do it on a, on a technical level, it, yeah. it kind of gets to a deeper level where it becomes actually about the way that your body works because it is a circular thing. It's about how you can take in breath, inhale and exhale because yeah. you know, carbon dioxide gets stored in the lungs. So if you're not exhaling properly, then you're going to get this in, this kind of buildup of tension and the tension mm -hmm. can make your head feel like it's going to explode. So it has mm -hmm. to be a cyclical thing and you have to be relaxed because if you're not relaxed, your muscles are going to give up on you. Um, and again, mm -hmm. that's a really good metaphor for this life in general, in that there has to be a release, you know, there has to be a, a circular kind of motion to, to, to what, whatever you're doing, you know, it can yes. be all, yeah. Um, yeah, it's phenomenal. I mean, if you don't really know how to, how to do it, then it just, it's this far out thing that like, <laughs> you're like, how did this person do this thing? Do you know what I mean? I suppose just like any any high level practice within your craft. Yeah. It just not, the craft. I can tell you how to do it. It's, it's really not that difficult. I can cut it. It's basically, if you, in normal playing, you, you blow through your lungs. And yeah. the air from your lungs goes onto the reed, the reed vibrates, and the vibration mm -hmm. from the reed creates the sound of the, the kind of rest of the instrument, whether that's a, a flute or saxophone or a piece of, you know, plastic. Um, so essentially the thing that makes the sound is just the vibration of the reed. Um, okay. With trumpet players, for instance, the reed is their lips on the same with flute players. Um, yeah. So for circular breathing, instead of blowing air through your lungs to make that reed vibrate, for like a split second, you open up your cheeks. You just allow your cheeks to fill of air mm -hmm. and you push the air quickly from your cheeks. And while you push the air from your cheeks, you breathe in quickly through your nose because you mm. can't breathe in and blow out at the same time, just physically. So in yeah. that moment that you're blowing through your cheeks, you breathe in through yeah. your nose, and then you keep going. But you've wow. got to basically be blowing, actually exhaling all the air so that you're blowing out the carbon dioxide. Because if you're not exhaling properly, um, and there's a blockage, you're going to find that kind of pressure builds up and up. Um, yeah, just doing that phase is basically. Were you were you circular breathing in the beginning in joyous? Um, I don't. At this days, I don't even know when I do it. it just happens no, automatically. Yeah, so yeah, natural. Yeah. Natural. yeah. Um, those elongated notes um, in the beginning, and it's one of the songs that, um, I, for me, has just been absolutely like transformative, and so, um, and I feel like it's important to 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 mention that because that particular song has carried me through the pandemic um, in a really profound way. This, the elongated notes in the beginning um, feel like this joyous promising. And it's crazy because thinking about the idea of that double breath that Nathaniel um, McKee was mentioning and the, the, the extended breath within that song really doubled down on the title of the song especially mm -hmm. thinking about the state of America and everything that's gone on in the world at the time. Um, that's a really that, old song of mine, actually. It's, um, I think it I wrote of... that, I've had that song for a long time. I wrote that song when I was in college, actually. Wow. Uh, maybe like 2006, maybe. And I actually, I remember specifically when I wrote that song, the first two chords of that song, it, they're from this Nielsen 
Nielsen is a classical composer from Scandinavia somewhere. Um, yeah. And I was listening to one of his wind quintets. Um, yeah. And there's just this one part that I was just like, those, that, those chords sound amazing, like really. Yeah. Um, so then I kind of went to the library and got the score out. I looked at the score, transcribed it, figured out, you know, what these two things, and it was two chords. It was like C major to like, I think F minor. Uh, yeah. or something like that. Or, so it was just some, some, some chord sequence. Um, but just the two of them. Uh, so then mm -hmm. I, I wrote them down on a piece of paper and then I just wrote every other chord sequence that I thought should follow that. And then that was the tune, you know. Wow. Uh, and then the melody came, you know. And it was really like, as soon as I heard that piece and I was just mm -hmm. like, I like, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that I like. I like, that's it. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was just the, the two chords. So like, yeah, just the, the kind of first two bars of the piece um the, the kind of the, the chord structure and then from that the whole piece has outlined itself you know wow it's definitely one of the one of the most beautiful songs i've i've ever heard like 100 oh, really? <laughs> and i'm not just saying that because we're on insta i i actually mean that not that and not that my opinion of the song means much but it's an absolutely phenomenal phenomenal song there's this like internal like this internal joy that's created and i think language is so important and um just in the choice of the songs that you the, in in the choice of the titles of the songs that you um that you've had has just been extremely profound in um in holding on to these narratives and holding on to these stories it's been like that in and of itself just attaches us to something so much bigger than us um mm -hmm. and as somebody that's not a musician just knowing that the, the titles on um, we were sent here by history or from a poem it's just it creates this beautiful like this connection it's like it's absolutely fantastic yeah i mean because like really you look, you're looking at freedom I, you know like if, if you if you go back to what you were saying before about the the freedom you have to to depict what you are as a as, as a chef like how you define mm -hmm. yourself you know for me it's yeah. like we have the freedom to to, to depict our music however we want yeah, you know? and, and yeah. that's something that I, I realized a, a while ago. It's like actually, I can literally do whatever I want. <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah. I, if I want to put a poem in conjunction with music, I can. Like literally, yeah. the sky's the limit. Like you know, can do anything. Yeah. Um, they can be tied to you know people like Anthony Braxton have really kind of mm -hmm. I think set a precedent for that in saying mm -hmm. that the music can be presented in whatever form we we choose to. If he wants to title this tune like CX Five, you know then CX51, CX52, that's fine, yeah. you know, and there will be a really, you know, kind of intelligent reason for that, but it doesn't have to yeah. be that your tune is called, you know, I love the shadow of your smile forever. Mm. You know, and that's, there's nothing wrong with it, but as long as that's what you want. Um, there's a period where I, I you know, I, I remember a period <laughs> where I started to do a lot of questioning. Um, a period when I started to, it was like I was reading a lot about uh, American he he uh, hegemony, um, mm. and trying to connect the fact that America is a cultural imperialist force to the yeah. fact that it obviously would have a, an impact on me as a, yeah. as a kind of creator of culture. Um, and trying to see if I can first be aware of what, what it was doing to me and then try to redress the balance um, in some way. And that was, I think, at the start of actually swarming sons of Kemet. Sons of Kemet was a, uh, on a, on a kind of abstract level, was a, a way of negotiating that. Um, mm. Trying to say, you know, I, the whole idea of what priority, musical priorities are, and what constitutes yeah. a good performance, or what constitutes an accomplished musician, uh, yeah. is, is kind of structured from ideas based um, in America, and nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with those those ideas. You know, nothing wrong with Americans, but yes. it's, that America <laughs> isn't all. You know, yes. so my yeah. idea when I started some the camera was kind of going, can is there a way of 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 researching and trying to employ musical ideals that don't stem from America, that actually stem yes. from traditional Caribbean music or Africa, or I say African music as a broad spectrum because actually. Yes. It, it can be seen as 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 a, as a unit if you if you want to, and then from yeah. that from that point, then you can get more specific. Um, but that was definitely yeah. my my idea when starting. You know, can we try to yeah just get 
get a bit more creative in, in, in why, why I'm looking at the, you know, music in, in, in certain ways. Kind of lost yeah. myself what, how, how I started talking about that now. No, it's all good. Does the idea of authenticity exist within the process of making jazz music in the same way that it's, say, for example, exists within the culinary world? And just like as a kind of small example that we've seen like issues within the restaurant industry in London and not, and I'm sure across the world, the whitewashing of the culinary scene and that um, our white counterparts have been able to kind of take on our cuisine no matter where we're from and then kind of make it um kind of create a satiation if you will to the to the white palette um and there's just been this agenda that has kind of created a perpetuation of the ability to to produce this food that that you know our people of color and black people haven't been able to do so is there that same concentration and need to 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 remain authentic um exist within your practice um some people believe that there is yeah and some yeah. people don't <laughs> okay. um yeah. i you know for me i think the the what you described in terms of the culinary world is definitely there in the musical world in terms of having a, an appropriation of, of of cultural forms um yeah. but in, in my own personal kind of relation to it i think that no one can do it better than people from the community that the music yeah. comes from and actually, yeah. by doing it better, we've gotten this idea of authentic authenticity partially from the work that was done by white anthropologists and white ethnomusicologists um, yeah. in the era when the world was a lot more racialized. You know, yeah. the idea of culture being a static, um, a static thing. You know, for me, it's like you know, you can have the culture because the culture is constantly being reinvented and reassessed. You know, mm. if someone wants to take a part of it and the problem is the monetization of it at the yeah, expense absolutely. of the communities, you know, you know, that, and that's that's a bigger issue. But in terms of yeah. culture itself, for me, I'm yeah. like, you know, there are, there, you know, there are ways that, you know, um, you know, like people from outside the black community may be appropriate, mm. that's, you know, form, forms of in black music, but black music progresses because black people yeah. progress. You know, of course. and for me, it's about going. You know what? I I can do whatever I did in the past better in the future, and I will continue mm -hmm. to do it. I will continue mm -hmm. to reinvent myself to the point yeah. where you're, you know, like chasing after, like you know, they've got that um, Jill got Heron song, you know, I'm um, chasing mm -hmm. after the white ghost. You know, yeah. you've got to be you're chasing after the black ghost. Yeah, you know, you're chasing after what you imagine blackness to be, but that blackness mm -hmm. is actually just uh, a premonition. You know, whenever mm -hmm. you think you understand it, you don't actually really. And that's, that idea goes back to a lot of African mythological stories. The idea of yes. metamorphosis and the idea of disguise. Um, you know, I really like that, you know, being able to mystify people. Even social media, like, you know, what, what is presented in social media is, is, is a mystified version of, mm -hmm. you know, it's me, for one, you know, mm -hmm. because... You know, it's not like I'm just putting the camera on and letting people see how I, you know, what, what, what's happening in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just like that idea of, you know, you, you might think that you're appropriating the culture, but you're not appropriating the culture. You're appropriating the ghost of the culture. You know, mm. as long as every, you know, as long as black people appreciate this and are constantly trying to move forward as opposed to trying to hold on to something. Yeah. You know. Um, but obviously you need to understand what your culture is and understand mm. how going forward relates to a, a detailed knowledge of what the past entails. I'm not kind of saying everyone needs to just constantly be going forward and forward and forward. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You know. just forget everything. Just as long yeah. as you're moving forward, you just forget it all. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because no. moving exactly. forward, like you said before, moving forward entails, the, the way you move forward is to, ref is to understand the past. You know, yeah. I mean, that's what, what, what moving forward means is is referencing the past. The more the past mm -hmm. is referenced and understood, then you end up in the future, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yo, um, it's 9.40. <laughs> well, it's 9.40 our time, yeah. This has just been, like, absolutely, like, just profound, yeah. It's just been so incredibly lovely to, like, 
just share space and share space, just engage with you and just chat about everything. Um, do you want to like plug something that people should, I don't know, look forward to or anticipate or um, just live in groove? Or... I, I wrote a piece, that piece that I mentioned for the big issue should be coming out, I think, tomorrow. Um, and okay. it really is a, it, it's, how do I describe it? It, it was a, a ritual to write. It really took a lot out of me. Um, yeah. I, I can't really kind of emphasize enough. I went into, I had to, you know, when I say dig deep, it was like thinking about race, like say for like three, preparing it for like a week, but for like three days from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, only yeah. thinking about, you know, the situation, you know, race, yeah. black history, um, black, what blackness is, how, how we go for what, what the situation is. Um, yeah. And I think the piece is, you know, it's, it's a good reflection of where I'm at. Even though I think, you know, it's like everything, if, if I had a chance to do some more edits, I would definitely, you know, update it. But I, yeah. I'm, I'm very happy with, with how I was able to articulate myself. Um, yeah. In the piece, so if anyone can read, if, you know, wants to read it, then it should be available tomorrow. Cool. Sounds Thank good. You. Is there a little bit? Is there a come down? Because I've experienced that with writing quite a bit. That you have to be in this, and it's not necessarily about inspiration. Like in no. moments of of that, inspiration doesn't exist. It's literally just about the idea of of just being what need what you need to be in those moments to produce the work that needs to happen. Yeah. Was there a bit of a come down afterwards, like a bit of a relief process that you could come outside of that and finally just gain, just have breath, just kind of sit yeah. back? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's what it is. Now that's now kind of I don't think about it. Yeah. What's that? But now you can try not to think about race for 24 hours. Yeah. yeah, but then it actually what I found is that I, because I've done a lot of thinking about race, my, my views on on the situation are, are clear, you know. Okay. It's not like I'm thinking there's something that I want to articulate that's not coming out. It's like I've articulated to myself to a point where at least I have a, 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 a fundamental position that yeah. I can move from and I can add to. Um, yeah. and you know I guess one of the frustrating things I did another interview for this um, Guardian article um, just after writing that and I really shouldn't have I, I knew I shouldn't have I had this little voice inside mm -hmm. me but don't agree to do this interview um, yeah. and I, I, you know it's like I think I was articulate in the interview because I've been doing so much thinking but then it's yeah. like the kind of disappointment of having just a few kind of cat's phrases used mm. in the kind of broader article um, where and, and for me it's like we don't need catchphrases at the moment yeah. you know we don't yeah, need we little kind of slogans that are kind of nice and digestible we just need detailed thoughts about what people think is ha what, what people are saying is happening and yeah. what people where people think we should go um, yeah. which maybe I wasn't thinking about before I'd done a lot of thinking um, yeah. now I've done thinking there's certain things now that are that I'm starting to see you know, like, you know, just the, the whole way of, of, of broaching all of these topics on social media. Um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, I guess, this way we're at, but it does reduce a lot of really complex um, discourse into kind of bite-sized dumb chunks, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and it doesn't allow the discourse to occur, which, again, yeah. kind of goes back to the problem of cancel culture. The discourse isn't allowed to happen. There's no room for the for the debrief. There's no room for the for the further conversation because we're trying to like create these very abstract and very sometimes untangible thoughts and ideas into really palatable bite-sized um, concepts, like you said. Yeah. And again, I think that sometimes we, uh, we 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 struggle to think outside of what's marketable. We struggle to think outside of the market, even within the way that we use our language. Sometimes we, we really struggle to, to use, use words that um, expand on the experiences and the individual ideas that we have, that we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to make people understand something rather than coming to an understanding on our own. Yeah. And also, like, you know, we're, we're speaking English. Um, yeah. If we're talking yeah, about that's it. restrictive enough. Yeah. yeah. We're talking about mm -hmm. ideas of, if we're trying to really think deeply on race, and we're talking yeah. about trying to unpick 
ideas that have been formed within the, the kind of mental structure associated with this language, you know, yeah. um, a language that has been imposed, then, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be difficult to try to really mm -hmm. think beyond, like really kind of put your mind in a space that it can go beyond the structures that are implied by the actual language itself. Um, yeah. You know, like, you know, it's, it's mind, like when I talk to guys from South Africa, we'll be talking about some stuff. And then there's a point where it's just like English isn't enough. There's stuff that mm -hmm. they just can be picked mm -hmm. in English. Um, yeah. So like when I write, I find, you know, a lot of the times I read it, I go, this is really complicated to read. It's not an easy read, but it's the only way I can describe with these English words that I know what I'm yeah, thinking. Absolutely. You know, if there was another way that was read, you know, I, I would do it, but you know, yeah, that's how it goes. Somebody, I don't remember who it was, but somebody had had given like a few different interpretations of what the phrase Black Lives Matter meant in a few other language, yeah. in a few other languages. Sorry. And the phrase Black Lives Matter in and of itself was so kind of reductive to what the other interpretations of what it meant kind of allowed it to be. And again, just like the, within these confines of the English language, like we are really, we, we often struggle like to, to find the ways that we can allow our emotions to express themselves in a way that's clear and a way that really means what these emotions like they're just they, they're just kind of you know suffocated yeah. on themselves in a bit of a way but yeah, but, yeah well, that, I mean I think well, at the end you know at the end once we've done it's like the unpicking the 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 need to articulate yourself always I think bears fruit you know, mm. like that tension of having to find a way of articulating yourself in yeah. in this in this language and within this language structure will find yeah. ways of you know dismantling it or, or ways of actually um depicting it to people that are here you know and if you yeah. look at the i think it was writer called what's her name carolyn yusuf i think it is Catherine yusuf um, anyway, this Algerian writer, French Algerian writer, mm -hmm. who was writing, um, was saying the idea of what's the mission of the diaspora, you know, and, you know, like what's be besides just ending up here or besides just yes. trying to do better than your parents or grandparents have, have done, yeah. you know, what's, what, what could the purpose be? And, and, and can we actually kind of um, imagine what our purpose could be outside of the box, outside of what? Is, is, mm. is kind of handed to us by society and i think yeah. one of those missions that we you know is to be able to translate um the course of european history yeah to europeans you know so something mm. you know, like you said earlier it's like when i'm doing all this work in terms of um depicting culture or depicting alternate um areas of history it's, it's being done for the purpose of, of black people but also for the purpose of white white people so that yes. there is, you know, that work that needs to be done in educating the population. Schools aren't going to do it. You know? Yeah, of um, You know, so as a performer, for me, it's like there is that, that thing of like these people, you know, they, there are some well-meaning people that have just been fed the propaganda of the state for so long that they believe yes. that, they believe the hype, the kind of, the kind of Western imperialist hype. Um, yes. And sometimes you just need to burn down Babylon in your streams yeah. and let them know that it's not all that it is. I mean, there was never like a decolonial project. So we are, our music and our art and our culture, and our culture is the decolonial project. Like exactly, we yeah. are, we are we existing are it, yeah. within that. Yeah, we are, yeah. And burn down Babylon for true, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been great, honestly. Like I want to thank Eternal Remedy um, and the rest of the team just for allowing this space to happen. The back, like the flat has gotten so dark. I've just, oh, yeah. the sun has just happened behind me. Um, yeah. But yeah. I put my great. light on from the beginning so that it can stay like oh, this. Yeah. <laughs> but, and now that's a bit too bright, but yeah. Thank Eternal Remedy for the space. Like it's been really, it's been groovy and it's been really beautiful sharing space with you as well. And just kind of, yeah, we're all looking forward to everything that you're going to have going on in the, in the future and, and the rest that we'll all be taking as everything starts to open up and we won't be going to pubs. That's important to mention. <laughs> no pubs, no one. No pubs. Um, maybe gyms when they open, but only at six o'clock, just after the cleaners have left. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. it. No change. Yeah. Um, if the people who are watching have it, we should have taken some questions. We kind of messed up there a little bit. 
it. But yeah, yeah. thank you for everybody for, for being here. But um, Eternal Remedy, continue to watch the space and follow them and us and stay tuned for everything else. But yeah, stay blessed. Like, um, take continue to take care of yourself. And we're anticipating everything that you have going on in the future when you when you come back to London and visit us up here because you're in okay. you're not in London, are you? Kind of not really, but you know, it's yeah, kind of yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I'm always in and out, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Cool. We'll hopefully see you around, and yeah, thanks for being you. We appreciate yeah, yeah. you. Thanks for yeah, thanks for for engaging me. It's been really good to chat to you. You know, like very, you know, it's been you a very too. kind of fulfilling conversation. No, absolutely. I feel the exact same. Um, we'll definitely keep in touch, and yeah, yeah thank yeah. you for everything. Stay well, yeah. Cool, you too. Bye. Um, nice. Thanks, everybody.